Thanks for taking a minute to tune into a fresh word. Here's what I've been thinking about in my devotions lately. Uh, that's uh, Galatians and the book of Galatians, specifically the whole teaching of the law in the book of Galatians. If you've ever had the question, how do Christians today, after Christ has died and risen again, relate to the law that's written in the Old Testament, and specifically the moral law of the Ten Commandments? Maybe like you, you're reading in the Old and the New Testament of the Bible at the same time. I was reading in Galatians and I was reading in Exodus both at the same time today. And I saw how the law is related to so differently in the Old Testament than it is the way Paul talks about it in the New Testament, specifically the book of Galatians. Well, it's an important question because if you don't understand the transformation, the fulfillment that's happened in the New Testament with the law of God because of Christ then you might continue in a very cold, hard, legalistic way of trying to live out the Christian life as many sought to do in the Old Testament. That's not how the Old Testament was intended. God didn't provide a secondary means of salvation that if you could gut out personal willpower and personal holiness and law obedience strong enough on your own, you would get to God. He never commended that, didn't teach that anywhere. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. But that was the way many took it in the Old Testament. We know that because Paul says in Romans 9, 30, they stumbled over the law because they did not pursue it by faith. So that's Paul's condemnation of the wrong understanding of the law in the Old Testament. But that understanding of the law is pervasive. You find it in churches and in Christian lives and in families. Often you hear it coming out in prayers and you see it coming out in people's lives. Here's the indications I have in mind. You either have a person who's very confident in their law keeping and they sound quite judgmental toward others. They sound quite condemnatory and critical and judgmental toward others. In fact, many times Christians are known by, by the world and unbelievers as being critical and judgmental people. And they look at our lives and they see flaws and weaknesses and they say, ha, huh, you're a hypocrite. I want nothing to do with you because the breadth of your hypocrisy is worse than mine, says the unbeliever. And in some times and in some cases, that's absolutely true. So you get the proud law keeper quite often and judgmental law keeper. But sometimes, and maybe I would dare say more often, you get the discouraged, bruised, ashamed, condemned, embarrassed, uh, I can never measure up kind of law keeper. The person who sees the law in the Bible and they treat the whole Bible as just a bunch of laws from a harsh judge, God, and I'm always failing at keeping those laws and so I am always discouraged. I'm always embarrassed, ashamed, guilty. I'm always frustrated and getting down on myself. And I find no help or hope from anyone else because any little plan or program or scheme that they give me to help keep the law, I try for a day or two and then I fail again. So the Christian life feels like a sinful, proud, boasting, look at how good I am, and yet really, see, really in the eyes of God and the world, it looks so ugly. Or it's a discouraged, belittling, ashamed, guilty venture that hardly anyone could ever sustain understandably so. Both of those are wrong views of the law that arise out of a faithless, loveless, spiritless relationship with God. Listen to what Paul says to the Galatians. He's correcting that whole problem in the book of Galatians, as he does in many other places, Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 9, um, Ephesians 3, and elsewhere in Paul's writings. Many of the other New Testament authors do as well, but none as fully comprehensive as the Apostle Paul. Here's, he, here's Paul speaking to the Galatians. They were confused over the law, to say the least. He says, But the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. This is 322. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned, until the coming faith would be revealed. So you see, God intended to give the law and that the law would have this imprisoning effect. This imprisoning effect. So that we would say, 
I see the law that you've given God. It's beautiful and good. I wish I was a law keeper, but all it does is act like bars of steel around me that keep me imprisoned. I don't want to do what the law says in my heart of hearts. I'd rather sin in my darkness of heart. But the law uh, is a dungeon that uh, embondages me inside of it. And I need help. I need a savior. I need you, God, to come and to so transform me that I want to obey the law. And then I obey it by faith, trusting in you. Verse 24 goes on. So then the law was our guardian. It's like a babysitter. It's like a governess. It's like a nanny. The law was our guardian. In the Old Testament, the law stood over the child of the king and the king seemed far away. And yet the guardian said, ta ta ta, your father wants you to do this and you must do it. He gave me perfect instructions and so I will not permit you to disobey your father. That would put me in danger as your governess, so you must obey. That's the way the law functioned in the Old Testament. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified, not by works of the law, but by faith. Now we come to God by faith and we say, there's only one child in the family of God who has obeyed the Father perfectly from a right heart, from a joyful, obedient heart, that's Christ. And we who are in Christ, trusting in him, are viewed as law keepers, just like he is. Glorious, magnificent, that's the gospel. So verse 25 goes on to say, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So now we are believing in Christ, inside Christ, making us adopted as sons of God. Men and women all regarded as sons because of the favor sons had. So men and women all receive the same favor from God because we are regarded as adopted sons of God, obeying him, our father, by faith. So then Paul makes this explicit further in chapter 5. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. In other words, don't go back to the guardian of the law. Don't go back to the practices of festivals and food laws and having to be circumcised and having to relate to the Ten Commandments as if you needed to obey them in order to please God and earn favor with him. Paul goes on to explain about circumcision, and then he comes to verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only, stunning, but only faith working through love. Now Paul is introducing something he calls the law of love, or what he calls elsewhere the law of Christ. Is he introducing this? Of course not. He's repeating it. Where did he hear it? He heard it from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 5, I didn't come to to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. And then he said, the whole law can be summed up in love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's how the law is fulfilled in Christ and in the Christian life. If you look through the Ten Commandments, have no other gods before me, honor your father and mother, uh, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't lie, don't bear false, bear false witness, and so many other good commands. These, these are the reflection of the heart of God, and God in his very essence, is love. So the law is love by its very essence because it's uh, the commands given from the God who is love. And then when you imagine each of those commands being lived out, you recognize that's exactly what love looks like. That's exactly how to love God and other people is to obey the Ten Commandments. So now we're law keepers in Christ. We're fulfilling the law of God the law of Christ, by trusting in Christ and his fulfilling of that law for us, then we turn and say, prove it through me, Lord. Change me so that I'm living an actual life of love because Christ and his spirit is dwelling within me. 
Make me the man or woman of God who's known for Christ-like love because I have already had the law of love fulfilled on my behalf by Christ. I don't have any shame or condemnation anymore. I'm not feeling like a failure and I'm not feeling like, uh, like I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm not feeling anymore like, like the law is out there and I have to gut it out and try to achieve it on my own, but I never can, so I feel discouraged all the time. That's not my life. That should not be yours. Nor do I feel how boastful and proud and arrogant I am. Look at all those other people who aren't obeying the law as well as me. They should listen to me and do what I tell them because all I have for them is criticism and condemnation because they're not obeying the law the way I do. No, no, I have none of that arrogance. God has removed it from me, not because of any virtue in me, but because of his great grace. He has given me a passion and you a passion to fulfill the law of love because it's who I am now. It's me being who I am in Christ. I want to keep my promises. I don't want to bear false witness. I don't want to commit adultery. I don't want to dishonor my mother and father. I don't want to have any other gods besides God. I don't want to take the Lord's name in vain. I don't want to steal anything from anyone. That's who I am because that's who Christ has made me by the transforming work of my trusting in him and him granting me the gift of new birth. There's a lot there. You might have a lot of questions. I always do. But I love how reading Exodus and Galatians made me think about those things today. And I thought, maybe you're wondering what's it like to regard or relate to the law now that you're a Christian. Well, there's a lot more to answer. And there's a lot of wise, godly writers like Douglas Moo and Tom Schreiner and Wayne Grudem and John Piper and many others who've written on the relationship of how Christians and the law uh, interact. But there's nothing better than just reading the Bible yourself. Read the book of Galatians, especially read Galatians 3 or Galatians 5, and you'll see exactly how God wants us to relate to the law. It's the wisdom of God that we live out, fulfilling it by faith in Christ, not as a means by which we climb up to God, as if I could take the law and put it up against the mountain of God's glory and climb up the mountain of God's glory by climbing every rung of the ladder of the law, keeping it with my own effort. No, no, no. It's much more like the train track that's going around the mountain and the gospel is the engine and the coal car and the diner car and the caboose and I'm just lounging, thanking God for my powerful ride up the beautiful mountain like a like a train riding up to the top of the Swiss Alps enjoying the glory all the way and then so I get up and I walk through the dining car and I speak of this God and I bear witness to him and I call out to the towns as I go by and the ones we stop at and I say join the train ride of the gospel climb on by faith your ladders will never get you to the top the only way to the top is riding in the train of the gospel on the track of God's character and love. Well, let me pray for, pray for you. Father, thank you so much for people who take a minute to join into my journey of faith as I think these things through. I pray that whatever I have thought of or read from your word might be life-giving and helpful and joyful to the people who have listened in. I pray your blessing over the faith family at the landing. I pray your blessing over the newly dedicated babies that we enjoyed commending to you in the worship service this past Lord's Day. I thank you for their parents and their siblings and their family members and extended family members and friends and this faith family that they are born into. I pray that you would re uh, bring great rejoicing in our lives as we carry out our mandate to model not law keeping, but faith uh, in Christ living for them. We pray, Father, that you would save them and all unbelievers at a early age, sparing us and them from a life of sin. Bring us to the joy of keeping your law by faith and loving it as our guide of wisdom and seeing how it's already and perfectly fulfilled in Christ. I pray, Father, that you would bless the homes, the lives, the families, the individuals, the relationships, the bodies, the dreams and desires and the prayer lives of our faith family. Guard us from sin and unbelief. Bless us richly with the joy of the Lord. May it be our strength for everything we face today and the days ahead. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Thanks for a few minutes to click in. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you soon.